Right, let's see what this twisted take on Alice in Wonderland is like. Let's hope it doesn't make Lewis Carroll spin in his grave. <laughs> Within the disciplinary department, Sasha was told what happened with Rose, Tai and Kat, how they suppressed the road home and scaredy Kat. Although they did a good job, he criticised them not summoning a department head after receiving the call. He told Kat to remember that she wasn't the same as the two newcomers. Well, she was the captain of the disciplinary team. <coughs> Sorry, the disparate team. Yes, I know English isn't my strong suit. That she held their lives. This didn't concern Kat that much as Sasha left the lounge. Then Flower entered with a pizza delivery. Finn was excited, asking what kind of flavour. Apparently, according to Ella, Sasha always buys pizza after scolding them. Rose thinks that it's because he's sorry about scaring them. Ella sees it as treating them as if scolding dogs. Tai didn't like the pizza with pineapple on it. Finn likes it, though. Apparently he used to be in a syndicate, and the other refused... Well, <coughs> the other thugs refused to eat it, so... He ate the loss of it. Well, as for what those thugs are doing now, well, they were killed by the sweepers in the back streets in Eden. And after that, he went legit. Ella saw that as outrageous and miserable. Yeah, the back streets are... Tai was unfamiliar with the sweepers. Rose described them as monstrous villains who lurk outside the nest, kidnapping people, killing, and eating them. They prey on orphan children that are unfortunate enough to be found by them. Finn asked if her team was wiped out once, Ella and Rose were concerned by this, Ella telling him not to ask questions like that, as she knows it's a sensitive subject. Tai was blushing red out of embarrassment. Finn saw this as his strat, preventing death by studying corpses, wanting to know from Kat as the same thing could kill them one day. Kat agreed believing that it will happen to him soon enough. This surprised the others. Cat then spoke of the hookah caterpillar. Cat was the only one working on it before that point. Constantly racking up an eclosion counter for every employee that entered its containment. Ella asks what would happen if the counter was filled. Kat hinted that it wiped out the last team. Last time that happened. Kat saw it as not her problem. Apparently the only way to stop it is to perform the highest level of repression work. But the energy wouldn't be enough, so they had to perform insight work. More efficient, but slower. The more it gnaws on others, the more energy it spews. Like a fountain. There's an order to perform repression work. Where the lower the agent's level, the more efficient the energy... <coughs> Sorry. The more efficient the energy production is... 
asking who that company would miss out of such a sweet honeypot fresh meat. Yeah, she said this with a psychotic smirk on her face. Finn wasn't too concerned, thanking her for honest answers. Ella didn't like hearing this. Taiyi was silent and terrified. Rose noted that they had to study it, if they wanted to live. Then there was an alert that mentioned that regular work hours had ended. Rose and Taiyi were glad to breathe in the fresh air within the nest once they were able to get to the surface. Rose offered to pay for their coffees. They went to a coffee shop called Coffing Lee. And after a minor problem with how to pay for it, they sat on a bench and Rose talked to Taiyi, who observed the card that she used during the payment. It wasn't a Lobotomy Corporation wing card. It was the wing card of her parents. Then Rose went on to tell Tai about her story. Why she loathes herself. Her childhood was content and bountiful. She was homeschooled by various teachers. Yeah, Rose was an elite. Much like Daniel was. Well, those of you who have played Lobotomy Corporation will know what happened to him. Anyway, her brunette mother and her blonde father worked for a much safer and stable wing than Lobotomy Corporation. Yeah, being in a convict army is probably much safer and stable than Lobotomy Corporation. They also had much wealth to spare after their graceful retirement. Graceful retirement meaning they retired when they were still alive. She would have lived the rest of her life as a happy and rich idiot. Had she not... Well, had she been a coward and less foolish? Well, there's one event that changed that. The Smoke War. An event that brought terror and sadness. It made her ask herself, were they the good guys? She understood that grim dark world for what it was, where good guys and bad guys, they didn't truly exist, just the perception of them. Morality can be blurry. She saw the smoke war as the strong and the weak kicking up strife with each other. The counterblow of a whirlwind that had taken the trash scattered by a gigantic typhoon. She wanted to know which side they were on and why other people were hurt through war. Ah, she speaks of collateral damage. One day, she was out and about with her teacher. She snuck away while her teacher was distracted and sidetracked for about three hours. She went up to a very tall and abandoned building and used the most expensive pair of binoculars that she could get to observe the boundary of the outskirts from the rooftop. She heard rumours that residual pollutants from the smoke wall were sent there. She observed the high-speed railroad that was standing between the city and the outskirts the dumping ground of the city, where those even the back streets would accept were sent to. Yes, beyond that 
high-speed railroads that circle the city. She saw all kinds of waste. Illegal robots. Killers. And children. Ah yes, like Enoch and Lisa. We know how it ended with them. The child that Rose's younger self observed was ragged, destitute, thin, and so hungry that they were eating rotten mush from a tin. This appalled her, feeling like she had some responsibility for dumping that tin there. She couldn't go back to her old life. She quit homeschooling and started attending public school dedicating most of her time to exercise and reading, refusing to accept that it's how the world goes round, watching the wings in their current ignoble state, graciously soaring like an angel, while spraying on the ground, specifically on those below them, as if they were going on a bombing run with Ride of the Valkyries in the background. Well, that's standard procedure for, for those barons in their fiefdom. She saw that being reborn as a new wing that embraces all, that was her goal. A dream too big to, re to be real. But it's something she needed to do, thinking like it's ridiculous to want change that big. An old-fashioned world entirely by herself. Finding it funny. Tai thought otherwise, as she told Rose passionately that she's living day by day without a thought. She can't even imagine being considerate and dreaming for others at such a young age. She thought it was cool. It was a life more helpful to this world than her beige life could ever be, telling her to be the centre of the wings and destroy the system that... <sighs> that had flipped so many rotten people inside out. Well, the facility is working on that currently, but that's for later. Rose saw Tai as her best friend, and Tai was proud of this. She then told Rose to, well, relax and enjoy the coffee, as they have work to do the next day. The next day, Tai was working on the hookah caterpillar. You noted that it didn't have a care in the world, just like her. It showed on her face that it liked scented candles that released the smell of a spring meadow, that it was lying on a pink mushroom that was the same pattern as the blanket on her bed, and lay on the same pose as her when she slept, seeing it as lazy like her, which was amusing to her. This was a bad result. As she left the containment unit, she felt... Drained, yet so peaceful. Ella asked if something weird happened. That it distracted her so much that her thoughts were about to explode and make her feel depressed. Tai denied this. Ella said that she felt that it was in a similar place as her. Way too similar, feeling empathy for it making her think certain things a lot, which wasn't a good sign at all. Her work result was good. They agreed to ask Rose if the same thing happened to her after she did her work. Then Rose entered the containment unit and she saw something that she was quite familiar with. The hookah caterpillar with the head of her younger self. 
She then lit the candles, played some classical music, and she saw the face of that naive girl that she used to be. Who couldn't be more comfortable with the show that was outside of her sheltered world. It disgusted Rose. And didn't want to be reminded of who she used to be. The hallucination of her past self. That threw a can of beans that she hated to have for dinner. This was a repression work. The emotion of refusal to face oneself. Which doesn't yield anything on its own. Manuel observed this and noted that one must face themselves through constant insight. The worm will fatten up on despair. It must feel from the emotions and doubts towards it. The energy will billow, which explains the blue vapour that he blows. Yes, that it blows, rather. Death will occur in the process. As for how to make silk, the silkworm must be boiled. Manuel then reveals that she was the one that killed the previous disciplinary team. Telling the manager to fear not. They were no more. As black liquid poured out of their orifices, as if they were trying out for a black metal band. She opened her eyes and said that it was just her and the manager. Their office was as safe as ever. Well, she's certainly subtle as the original. As in not very. Back to the present, Tai was concerned about Rose due to everyone being worn out after they came back from the hookah caterpillars containment units. Yes, that hazy mess. Rose said that she was alright, but her tone said otherwise. Cat walked by and said that it was what happened the last time. Someone said that before they dropped dead. That their overinflated egos... So many thoughts about themselves. It feeds the hookah caterpillar. Rose couldn't argue with this, noting that Cat was devoid of any interest of herself and others. She's almost invisible to that abnormality. Some would think that it ignores as, well, there's barely a snack on her currently. Rose envies her indifference. Even if history were to repeat itself, it wouldn't matter to her. Yeah, great. Kat is a straw nihilist, isn't she? Although, it didn't stop her from being slightly troubled by this. Even though she didn't intend to die. And Rose could see this and was glad that they wouldn't lose her. Kat then asked the little rat, Tai, what she was chattering about, treating Rose as if she was speaking a dead language. Tai mentioned that she wished all of them were safe. They were like a family, thinking that Kat was cool and strong. This made Kat exit, while looking at Tai as if she was strange. Then we see Ella and she was traumatized by her working on the hookah caterpillar. The thoughts hurt. They were plaguing her head. Kat saw this as murmurs of the panic, and just as she was about to use her golden ladle on Ella, Finn beat her to it and snapped Ella to snap her out of her disturbed mental state. Ella thinking that it was nice that he didn't have to work with the hookah caterpillar. He was there to deliver a nutritious tonic from safety by Sasha. Ella thinks that it's nice to have a team that cares, thanking him 
he offered Cat a drink after realising that she was there. According to Ella, it had honey in it. Ah, so there are bees outside. Let's hope they're not from the Nicholas Cage apiary. Cat seemed troubled, remembering Tai and Rose looking happy. She then ran away from Ella and Finn, much to their confusion. She had a crazed look on herself, calling all of them mice, mice, they're rats, all of them. Meanwhile, Bebe was in a meeting. She spoke of the hookah caterpillar's occlusion counter. It was over half of the threshold, and someone on the display team was under serious mental pressure. Bebe asked Sasha who that was. Sasha knows who she's talking about. Daisy thought that he bullied that one, calling him a mean boss. He denied that. Joe was more concerned about losing a whole team of employees like last time, as it would result in severe financial loss as well, which needed to be prevented. Sasha mentioned that it had just arrived there at that time. They lacked the info on how it functioned. Suhu wanted to add to the topic of information, much to Bebe's surprise, since the eclosion counter was as high as it was, the energy figures were exceedingly positive. They were awash with surplus energy. Bebe understood that if they had enough energy to spare, then they might be able to make something... Yes, Sasha was also planning to contact that group. But at the time, the damage was done before they could be called. Joe agreed that it was possible. Daisy wasn't a fan as they creeped her out. Suho looked forward to that action. Bebe wanted her team to be informed in advance to prevent them from being slaughtered. Sasha wanted to handle this internally, but understood the need for them regardless. Yeah. This was, of course, referring to the rabbit team of Arkorn. They are quite deadly. And quite useful if used properly at the cost of 25% of the maximum energy per section called upon. Meanwhile, Tai had a bad result with the hookah caspella. She was drained. Rose handed her one of the drinks that Finn brought to them. Then Kat told them to think fast and delivered black lightning, which... Shot them both while scorching their EGO suits. She apologized as it grazed her. Wait. Was she intending to hit them directly? Apparently the hookah caterpillar makes people crazy. Well, shouldn't work on you, cats. You're already there. Tai considered that awful, and Rose was annoyed that her EGO was damaged. Kat brought some new ones. This one based on what Tai had just worked on, the hookah caterpillar. Then there was a panic alert. Kat gleefully rushed to deal with it. It was on floor 7, in the corridor of the safety team section. Rose then did another work on the hookah caterpillar. That looked different that day. She saw the younger version of her. She was in a limo. Or at least the back seat of a vehicle. Yes, she was observing a big screen on a large building, showing a child 
that was rescued from the outskirts and had found a home. Yes, they were in foster care. As for what he thought about that, this child spoke of how they had to live in a landfill, littered with trash that people from the nest threw away. They seemed to consider this normal to the nest inhabitants. Yes, as far as that child was concerned, that was the case. Seeing those that lived in the castle named the nest as sinning. And she agreed with that. But she thought, how dare they speak so arrogantly when they were the ones who rescued them? The hookah caterpillar called her a hypocrite. She could never understand people living outside the nest, because they're that. Then Rose, at least this illusion of Rose, had wings sprout out that matched her suit. Sasha noted that the hookah caterpillar had enclosed and had breached containment. Lau was surprised by Taiyi rushing to Rose's location, but the other clerks dragged her to the lounge to increase their own survival. Rose was on the floor. She was bleeding from the mouth, but she was still alive. Much to Taiyi's relief, she wanted them to leave, or the blue smoke would kill all of them. The hookah caterpillar had turned into the hookah butterfly, as the head was that of a butterfly with wings, and below was a deceptively delicate body. In level 4 control, the smoke was stifling. In level 5 information, the smoke permeated the body and mind. In level 6 training, it was described as a pale attack that absorbed and congealed life force. It attacked the soul. Level 7 safety, a clerk was heading to the lounge in order to take shelter there. Finn attacked it with his axe, frustrated by how hard it shell was. Ella was barely able to stand. Thankfully, the EGO provided by cats provided more protection against the pale damage of the hookah butterfly. Sadly, her weapon was that which dealt pale damage. So, against this abnormality, it won't be effective. Finn then continued to attack it. Tai and Rose came into the battle to exist. Well, assist, yes. Ella advised breaking the carapace to aim for the body. Tai wanted to bring out the EGO she was carrying. Cats wanted them to hide in the hole while the protection of their EGO suits lasts to evacuate. If they don't want to die, well, they decided to retreat on Cat's orders. Tai noticed that Rose was standing still in front of the hookah butterfly, bleeding from her eyes, nose and mouth. Tai being dragged away from this by Ella and Finn, as Ella noted that their EGO was at its limits, and Finn was noting that Rose had gone nuts. Thankfully, cats rushed to get Rose out of the, the way. Yes. Pushed Rose out of the way, and once they were outside of that particular area, Sasha gave the word, saying, Now, this summoned the rabbit team. And on the orders of Captain Mio, 
They were there to graze some grass. Warping into that branch. Hopping into work. Eliminating all on sight. Finn was almost shot by them as the door was closing. Thankfully, the rabbit team focused most of their attention on the hookah butterfly. Raining a volley of gunfire on it. Tearing through it like a fire hose to a paper lantern. But it regenerated. The rabbit team were suffering damage, but they kept focusing on taking it out. Where it was only a matter of firepower and time. Then it burst out of the wrecked body. Hail the rabbit team! Their work was done. Elecorp could clean up the rest. One of the rabbit team felt their innards melting. One of them didn't want to say that in front of Mio. Yes, the red mist fangirl. After that battle. The Dispero team were all very much alive. Cat noted that the butterfly had returned to a worm. Or a caterpillar in this case. She would work on this again. Thanks to Rose, they had plenty of energy. Certainly enough to make up for the energy used to call the rabbit team. As she turned to walk away, she was struck in the back by an irate rose, which surprised everyone, including Kat. Taiyi cautioned her not to continue, but Rose didn't listen and shouted at her. As she was holding up her golden ladle in defense, that she'd be very much glad if she killed her on the spot. The others were afraid of what might happen. Thankfully, Rose got away with a punch in the chest, which made Rose collapse. Tai supported her as Cass walked away with a vacant expression on her face. How did Cass become what she was? Well, in Bottle of Tears, we get her origin story. As she looked at her favoured EGO weapon, her golden ladle, she remembered her first day in the Bosme Corporation, at a time before Sasha had his scars and a cybernetic replacement eye. It felt so nice to move to a nest and eat real beef every day. Yeah, it's clear that she wasn't born in the nest, but rather the back streets. If that was what stood out, she didn't understand what was wrong with that. Eating tasty things was happiness to her. She made a friend with a big, tough female agent that was a bit too physically affectionate for her liking. Sasha then left a bag of (coughs) sandwiches from Ham Ham Pang Pang. It was given in advance as a welcome. Beef Pang Pang was apparently a toasted sandwich with stir-fried pork and some spiciness. Hmm, Not sure how that fits in. And apparently that's a real menu item in the real Ham Ham Pang Pang. That's in South Korea, by the way. Kat saw them as nice people although she was shocked by her beating one of the employees, explaining that they needed to calm them down to subdue the panicked. Although she was scared of how that company and people treated others in general, seeing abnormalities as beings that have lost their hearts, which is what this tough agent liked about her. Cat's first abnormality was the bottle of tea. A Zayin level threat. A safe introduction. Well, as long as she doesn't eat the cake on top of the bottle. 
she should be fine with doing any work. She then spoke of a senior that came to work cheerfully, which then bashed their head against the wall at noon. Another senior also lost it and ran around the corridors until evening. They were both sent to the wars and had no memory of what they did. And then they were back to work the next day. And that's abnormality attacked Sasha. Well, whatever drove them insane and made him lose his left eye. She went back home and was unnerved by the naive faces that laughed and chatted. Yes, it was unsettling for her, which is why she moved to a dormitory in order to not see that. She was scared to live outside. More so than living in the dormitory. She wanted a strong will to live on there. Then she saw one agent dead. And her friend, she was pummeling the crazies into submission. She then realized that she didn't need emotions or a heart. Where she could abandon reason and protect herself to survive in that wonderland. As her mind snapped and she became outside reality. To put it mildly. Yet she still had some measure of control over herself, as she saw Red Queen and White Lake, among others, all those containment units, and then she decided to eat a piece of the cake, which made the bottle of tears crack, and paper slips with drink me written on them. me. It's another twisted take on Alice in Wonderland, isn't it? The bottle was a reference to what shrank Alice when she drank from the bottle. While the cake was a reference to Eat Me, where the cake made Alice bigger. Well, after she took a piece of the cake, she found herself swimming in the floating water. This made her as unhinged as her once neat hair was. We then go back to the present, as the golden ladle for the same slip that was in the bottle of tears revealed its origin. Well, to us anyway. I've looked at what's next, and I'm going to have to dedicate a whole lore video on this one, as the story is that long. Until next time. Hail the rabbit!